Welcome to CivilNet. My guest today is Umut Kurt. He is a PhD candidate at Clark University and a lecturer at Sabandri University. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Umut. Thank you for inviting me, having me uh, here. You are an expert uh, on the confiscation of properties of the Armenian people uh, during the Ottoman Empire uh, in 1915. Uh, and I think the vocal point is primarily Aintab, which is where you are from. Um, but before we talk about uh, your research and your findings, uh, what are you doing today in Armenia? Um, I'm doing some research in the various archives of uh, Armenia in Yerevan. Uh, I had done a considerable research in um, Hayastan As uh, Askagan archives in Asga in Krataran and Madanetaran. Right, the National Archives of Armenia. Exactly. And I'm, I've been quite comfortable for the, since I have been here. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have had no difficulty in terms of being able to reach out uh, documents or sources or the visual uh, stuff which I was asking for. So uh, I think which I just recognize and notice uh, since I have been in Yerevan and working in the archives intensively, I think uh, Armenian prim primary sources written in Armenian language I think has to be explored in our genocide scholarship in order to shed light on the different aspects of Armenian genocide. And also if we want to uh, explicate and if we want to just, you know, explain the, the the, the, the whole the event, the whole the issue from the vantage point of the victims, uh, that's why we should really uh, make use of the Armenian sources. That's why we need to know Armenian, how to read and how to write. And you do, which you do know. Uh, pretty much. Pretty much. Yes. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Umut. Uh, are you saying that the Armenian archives have not been explored as extensively as perhaps they should be by researchers in genocide studies? I think so. I mean, it's the whole picture uh, for the time being. In the, in the genocide scholarship, at least the Armenian genocide scholarship, it's a, of course, the Wahal Kandadrian and the Tanerakcham have just carved out to all the, uh, the, 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 the big uh, the portion of the Armenian Genocide Scholarship. They have, they have um, done a lot of research and a, lo a lot of uh, invaluable uh, articles and manuscripts they published. Uh, but uh, actually, it's, it was the main uh, point of view of the Wahal Kandadrian because he was always hesitating to use our main sources, our main primary archival sources, in order to be, let's say, neutral vis-a-vis right. -vis the arguments which might have come from the Turkish, Turkish side. Uh, but now, actually, things have changed. The scholarship is now being more and more critical. And, uh, and the, of course, Ottoman archives are open, but every month, every week, uh, many documents are cleaning out. For instance, I'm trying to reach out to the, how the abundant, so-called abundant properties laws uh, had been applied in the various localities in Anatolia. I wasn't able to find out anything about it. For instance, in Aintab, there were liquidation commissions which were established in September 1915 in order to liquidate Armenian mobile, deported Armenians' mobile and immobile properties. Mm -hmm. And Aintab one of, was one of the uh, province, the way in which the liquidation commission was set up. One, and liquidation commissions used to have their own notebooks, which listed like registers exactly every there, single every them. single property of the deported Armenians. But now, I haven't been able to just. Uh, it's interesting that it. you mentioned that because uh, you know, we just I just interviewed uh, Professor Tana Akjan via Skype, and we talked about whether or not the Ottoman archives were indeed open or mm -hmm. not, and how uh, there had been a cleansing. Uh, process. Uh, uh, process. Uh, now, in light of uh, Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan's message to the Armenian people on April 23, when he mentioned uh, that you know our archives are open, there's hundreds and thousands of documents. There's a lot of contradictory messages. Yes. Uh, and when we speak with scholars and academics like yourself, and we we, we sort of delve and and discover what the true Actually, uh, situation um, is. As a matter of fact, I have been uh, telling myself I need to take pictures of in front of the each and every archive in, Yer in Yerevan in order oh. to convince them that the archives are open here. Right. So the, I think Prime Minister is, of course, it's a policy. I mean, it's a political strategy to push the Arme Armenia to the corner as much as possible. But on the other hand, I really strongly believe the fact that I think he is not aware of anything, the things, how the things are just, you know, going on here. 
I think he maybe he misled. Mm. We don't know. But I just want to just not not uh, because of the fact that I am in Yerevan, but I, I will just easily comfortably say that archives are open. Mm -hmm. Every single research mm -hmm. can make use of the archives here in a very, very comfortable way. Well, the study of history or, or any academic endeavor, if there's no integrity or truth to it, then, yeah. yeah. Uh, Fortunately. Yeah. Fortunately. Uh, I want to come back to the issue of the confiscation of Armenian properties and I was reading some of your interviews and some of the papers. You're, you're a published author and you've been studying this for many years. Uh, you know, oftentimes when we think, you know, as Armenians, when we look back at our family history and we look at what we lost and the potential of income that we lost and, uh, you know, at, at one point you think that it was uh, not part of the state apparatus necessarily uh, to confiscate the goods, but the you know, Armenians were deported and whoever else came, uh, but it was a real, uh, it was a, a state mechanism that had its branches, that had its employees, that had its uh, corresponding laws, like the abandoned properties law, so it was all encompassing. There was a systemic um, motivation, not a motivation, a systemic um, mandate to indeed confiscate all those properties. All I, I was gonna just point out have been pointed out by you actually. It was exactly what you have pointed out. It, it was exactly what just you have explained the whole process. Uh, confiscation or the despoliation of the property of any ethnic group is a structural component of genocide, which means the extermination and annihilation of the every single group of a population as a as a nation, as a religious community, and so forth. So. Uh, of course, physical elimination of any society is an important and indispensable component and the feature of the genocide. But on the other hand, you can also make a population which is present uh, and you can turn the same population in question into uh, uh, nothingness, you know, by, disbelief, by plundering and by, you know, uh, confiscating their properties. Armenians, deported Armenians, uh, were stripped out of their properties and then within this way Armenians did not even have any penny to bribe the, you know, the security forces during the death, death marches. Mm. That's the whole process. So uh, of course there's, there was a legal, the huge legal and an enormous legal structure behind it and this legal structure what have been inherited by the Republic uh, rank and file and uh, Mustafa Kemal and his disciples as well. And all the laws and the regulations and other you know, legal mechanisms have been revised, updated according to the circumstances in currency. And that's the reason why of it's a, it was a state orchestrated, state-led process, but of course state uh, was not able to control the whole process. You can make a clear-cut comparison between the organization uh, process during the Nazi regime, mm -hmm. organization of the Jewish properties, and the con Turkification or the confiscation of the Armenian properties. The processes, and there, there are considerable similarities mm -hmm. and convergences between these two processes. It was not only ideological, it was economic. And now talking about the economic factor of that, um, it's curious for me uh, if there has been if it's even possible to do some kind of study, calculation, mm -hmm. uh, based on the number of people that were actually deported, killed, murdered, exterminated, the properties from cultural to personal exactly. to, you know, to community, from churches yes, and schools yes. and factories. Books and... Yeah, yeah, books, uh, potential income like we mentioned, exactly. we talked about earlier, you know. Yeah, uh, harvest. Is, is there uh, any way that that can be calculated? Uh, actually, it's, um, it's, it's not a part of my dissertation right. project, well, but of course it's a very tenable question. And as far as I know, I don't know the exact figure of the, uh, of the, you know, the real value of the lost properties and mo bought mobile and immobile properties of Armenians. But uh, Dikran Kuyumcuyan, who, I mean, who for the first time uh, wrote on this subject matter specifically, and he came up with a specific uh, calculation in the value of the, uh, I mean, despoiled proper properties and the, or the incomes of the Armenians. But I don't have any number to explain here, to just to mention here. But I can give you an answer. I uh, came across a, a case of an Armenian from, Calif from California. Mm -hmm. 
and I don't want to give any name. He, he was uh, seeking for the uh, claim or getting back the restitution of the real value, at least the real value of his... In today's... Uh, uh, exactly, exactly. His um, grandmother's properties in Aintap. And I have been also trying to pinpoint where the properties were located. Does he have the actual documents? Yes, yes. He, share, he, he has shared them with me. And I also know who got now who are currently using and you know taking advantage of those properties of uh, his grand, uh, grandmother and he calculated 50 million dollars just we are talking about only just one individual properties that the loss or, or the, the properties and uh, yeah, that they and had land to and turn. for the statue you know land soils and two houses we are and one village, you know, we are talking about one village, and uh, one woman, a couple one of village, yes, a few Armenian. Uh, they were really uh, rich in family yeah. families in Aintab, and they used to even possess a village. A family would own yes, a village. Yes, yes, exactly. So, economy. Uh, I I just want to go back to your first uh, statement regarding the economic motivation behind the Armenian genocide. It is. It is an indispensable motivation, or it is an indispensable kind of factor in order to. Uh, transpire the uh, the aspects of our main genocide, the reasons of our main genocide. You know, but it's not the only, it's not the sole reason. Of course, there, there were political and the religious, you know, motivations, but economic motivation paid the way for the Union and Progress Party leaders to draw, to get the support and the consent of the different sections of society within Anatolia to exterminate our Armenians as a whole. Yeah. The economic incentive always exactly. works, Exactly. That's it? the reason why, my, the, theoretically speaking, my dissertation is trying to shed light on mm -hmm. uh, and trying to argue that this, the whole process, the genocide and the despoliation of the properties were not being executed only by the order of three or four guys sitting at the center of Istanbul. Mm -hmm. Unless there was, you know, huge support of ordinary Muslims, or the you know local and provincial notables within the different localities uh, in Anatolia, our main genocide wouldn't be able to carry that. <laughs> uh, Umut, thank you. It's been uh, really fascinating our our discussion here. Um, as a final question, uh, because the uh, the question of the Armenian genocide has been so politicized, and uh, as a scholar, most scholars don't want to get involved in that political debate, but it is yes. what it is. Yes. Um, we are now on the, the cusp of the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, do you see, um, with Erdogan's statement, however veiled it might have been, however genuine it might have been, uh, uh, and with the interesting renaissance that we're seeing in Istanbul by you know, certain layers of Turkish society in uh, Eastern Turkey as well, or what we call Western Armenia. Um, is there, is, is it a fundamental shift that is going to lead anywhere? It is, it seems a fundamental shift. In my opinion, it's not a fundamental shift, but it's a shift, at least. Uh, what I believe is that, I think, after matter of the Kondalos' message of the Prime Minister Erdogan, Turkey is not going to turn, you know, turn back from that point. Is not going to get away from that point at least. So at least the prime minister has given us a kind of, let's say, carrot, mm -hmm. the way in which we are going to use and we are going to make a pressure on him. You know? and, and I think we wouldn't see any official denialism at the state level in Turkey regarding Armenian genocide. Maybe they're not going to recognize Armenian genocide in the, in the short term, mm -hmm. but I think it will also happen. You this think is it's what irreversible? I mean. It's irreversible. It is irreversible, exactly. So now it just depends on how yeah. uh, clever we are to use that exactly. to move the process forward. Exactly. So, I mean, I think we, we shouldn't only focus on the Armenian genocide as a whole. Mm -hmm. We should focus on how this process was executed in, in Marash, in Adana, in Aintab, in Dikranagat, in Vaspuragan. And then people get, you know, aware of the whole process. I think people are already aware of the, you know, Armenian genocide. I know that. But publicly, they don't want to articulate it. But I think this kind of shift may also pave the way for, you know, uh, let's say, overcome this obstruction.
within the society. Very good. Thank you very much you. for this very, very interesting conversation. Thank, Thank you, you, you for coming to CivilNet and good luck My with pleasure. your archival studies <laughs> here at the National Archives. Sure, Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, thank you for watching CivilNet. Uh, my guest was Umut Kurt. He is a PhD candidate at Clark University and a lecturer at Sabanji University. Stay with CivilNet.